My name is Liam Bastic, and for the next hour, I'm going to be presenting a modern Excel webinar on modeling and forecasting using modern Excel. Um, going to do a bit of a whistle stop tour of all the things in here. So if you do have any questions, do fire them off. What I'll try and do is leave time at the end rather than sort of interrupt the flow. Uh, I believe this is also being recorded, so uh, you'll be able to look back and have a look at things and see where I made all my mistakes later. So we've had Ignite recently down in Florida, and what I want to do is showcase a few things there uh, which will uh, be part of modeling and forecasting going forward and they can access. So it's meant to be, as I say, a whirlwind whistle stop tour of some of the useful features in today's Excel. Uh, in this time, I'm going to go at a reasonable pace, but make sure that I uh, can keep you going with me as I know there is a refresh rate issue. So, so we will go through. Uh, we'll look at uh, dynamic arrays the XLOOKUP function, something that's been around a while that people don't seem to know, forecast sheets, and even tables that have been around even longer. And I'll also give you an idea of an alternative to pivot tables in here. We've only got an hour. I'm not going to be considering things like rich data types. Anything that starts with the word power, I haven't got time to look at this. They're great things and you should look at them. Uh, the sensitivity and security features that were announced at uh, Ignite, I won't be looking at either. And um, VLOOKUP will never appear in any presentation I do, but that's a running joke. OK, I'd like to point out this is not death by PowerPoint. So I'm going to come straight out of this. You came along to see stuff in Excel, so why don't we go straight to Excel then? And uh, here's something I prepared earlier, and I'll try and maximize this because it's not gone. Now, for some reason, it's not going down to the end here. Just a minute while I figure this out. This is what I like my live. It was all testing fine before, and then it suddenly decides that it's not going to have this last bit here. So I'm just going to make it wider. Where there's a will, there's a way. I love. <sighs> You're going to be like that today, aren't you? OK, right. No problem. I'm just going to make this a bit bigger because the more space we've got, the better. So this file will be available afterwards. I'll explain how at the end you can email me, uh, Liam Bastic uh, at someproduct.com. That is .com, not .com. That seems like a. Uh, and um, I will explain how you can get that, and um, we'll also perhaps circulate it via the webinar series as well. Uh, I have a starter file I'm using. The actual file that we'll be sending around is actually a finished version, so you won't actually need to uh, sort of be playing along with this at this point in time. But I want to show you how you can actually do some stuff. And I was thinking, well, I've got to talk about modeling, I've got to talk about forecasting. What can I show you in the time, which is going to be relevant to everybody, given that not everyone's on Office 365, not everyone knows about dynamic arrays and all this sort of stuff, but it's now available. It's So dynamic arrays is now generally available on the web. It's rolling out. So if you don't get it on your web version just yet, I gather it is coming in the next few days, so don't despair. Um, it's another reason why to actually get move over to Office 365. And I thought, you know, we need to show you this because there are time savings to be had. So that's what I thought I would go through. So I'm going to put a start date in. Why don't we do today's start date, which is going to blow people's minds in some parts of the world. I gather them, the audio disappeared. Can you hear me now? Right, so I'm hoping that everyone saw me put the date in. Apologies for the technical issue there. Um, thanks for letting me know. The number of periods, I've set up some data validation. If you don't know how to create a drop down list, uh, a test here uh, is to click on data. And then from there, you go to the validation, which is this like on here. Because I'm on a lower resolution, I haven't got my ribbon in all its glory. But we've got in here data validation. And this brings up a dialog box. I've created a list of the numbers 1 to 20, which I could have put in a cell. Uh, I could have just had a whole load of numbers in cells. I did it this way to show you could do it that way too. And so I can just put in here the numbers 1 to whatever, and away it goes. So let's put, I don't know, let's start with 6. So far, so good, so what? Now, I've given these range names already. So this is called number of periods. All you have to do to give it a range name is to type in here in the name box and it will put it in. And here I've called this example start date. What I'm going to do now is show you how you can build a little financial model out of this. So I'm going to show you some of the functions that are available and uh, to show you some dates. Now, 
when you actually are modeling time series, so this is important for both modeling and forecasting, you're going to need dates. It's best not to type them in. They should be dynamic. That's the whole point. And there are functions out there that will do this for you and that will create the dates. Before I need that, though, I need a counter so it knows which one to use when. So I'm going to put here in this cell, for instance, I'm going to go, OK, I'm going to create a counter. Now I could just go um, the cell to the left. Plus one which is what people will have done in the past. And that's fine, I can do that. But what I want to show you is one of the new dynamic array functions in here. So there are various functions in here. Now, again, you might not see this to start off with. If I type sequence, I have here uh, the actual function says, right, I can create a, a sequence. And I can say, if I put six in here, it puts in here the numbers one, two, three. And because I've hidden a row here, the four is hidden. Uh, five and six. It's going down. If instead I put a one in front of this, it says actually I want it to go in the columns and it will therefore go across. And that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to do sequence one, not six, but click on this cell here, number of periods, and it puts it across. Do you see that as I change this, it actually moves this to two? I can move it to 19 and away it goes. Now, this is useful in modeling because often we have rolling budgets and we want to extend forecasts and things. If we can actually build models based on this idea of what is called spilling, we can actually create uh, calculations very quickly where we don't have to keep copying over and over and over. Because if we have to actually copy columns and keep moving them across, we put this at the risk of an end user who may do the same thing and not copy it correctly and the model becomes erroneous. So this is one of the things that we can do here, sequence. But we can extend this. As I said, there's a function in Excel that is will generate dates for you. EO month, I always call it the old McDonald function. Old McDonald had a function, EO, EO month. Um, if I go EO month, it requires a start date and how many months you want to be from that start date to give you the end of the month, EO month, end of month. There's a similar one called E date, which gives you the same date in each month, but I'm going to use end of month. So if I put EO month this and go comma zero, that would actually give me the 30th of November 19, because that's the end of the current month. If I put a one in here, it will go to the next one, 31 December 2019 and so on. And we're working it across. If I go minus one, it will give me the previous month. Perhaps you can see where I'm going with this. Maybe what I'll do then is I'll make this dynamic as well. So end of month, go into this, this date here. So there's my start date. And then I'll go sequence. And I'll say, right, I want it to go horizontally, so I have to put the one first. And I'm going to go, how many periods do I want it to go? This number of periods, close brackets, minus one, because in the first period, I want it to be the end of the current month. So the first number is going to be one, one minus one is zero. So if I do that and press enter, I get these dates. Now, if you do this, you won't get those dates. You will get a number that if you have formatted it as a general, so if I went to home and I went to general here, it would actually be 43799 because it won't automatically format. But because of the time here, I've actually formatted the date already. Um, and you will have to still do that. It's not clever enough just yet to actually put all the formatting in. So what I've done is I've formatted this already in here. So I've got the dates. I can actually then extend this a little bit further. I can say, OK, my start date will be then right. Well, if open brackets, the first period is one, but I can I can highlight this range. You highlight the whole range. Do you see it comes up J22 hash? Now, if I click on hash, let me sort of explain where this comes from. I'm going to just jump out of this for a second uh, and I'll show you a table we created earlier. So this here is a set of data which I'm going to use in a minute or two. If I turn this into uh, a table, I go to insert and I go to in here to table or keyboard shortcut control T on a PC. My table has headers, click OK, and in table design, I'll call this source data. Always a good idea to name your tables. If I were to go over here and go equals and just highlight this whole thing here, do you see it highlights the whole thing without any formatting because it's using this spilling again with dynamic arrays, but the actual formula in here, it says source data hash all. This hash symbol keeps coming up. It means the complete set and it's consistent with the syntax from tables. So just be aware of this when, when you're putting this in. So we 
dynamic arrays have been around a while. If you're thinking, Liam, I can't use them, I haven't got it. They're on the web now. This is it, it's become generally available, which is why I thought this was a prime time to do this. So if I go back to this, I go if and highlight this range. Go in here, J22 hash, that's saying that whole row. So if it extends, it will go further. If it equals one, so if it's the first period, I'm going to go and get the start date, example start date. Otherwise, I'm going to go and get the end of the month. Month here, and I'm going to say OK, I'm going to go back to my start date and I need to go so many periods from now. And for reasons I won't bore you with here, this is going to be one comma the number of periods. Close brackets, minus two, close brackets, just one. Put that in, that gives me the dates and the one before. Now, some of you might be thinking that seems a bit contrived here, Liam, because why didn't I just take this date and add one to that? You'll find if you use dynamic arrays where one range calls on another, you'll get what's called a circular reference going. So you need to get imaginative as to how you will actually have these things coming through in the meantime. But it's good to have this because then I can calculate the number of days and a function that came out, for instance, in uh, Excel uh, 13, I think it was. If I go here, this, comma that, Gives me the number of days, but well, I won't do it like that, will I? I'll go instead. These are all dynamic ranges, so I'll go in here, Excel that, comma this. That unfortunately subtracts off the first day, so you have to add one to it. If I put this in, I get in here these things because it's the wrong way round. Notice you actually have to put the end date in and start date first. It's a classic gotcha that goes on in here. I see this all the time in models, which is why I'm trying to show it to you. Trust me, I was. I put that in. This has not been formatted correctly yet. That's all right. Put it in and we're good to go. So this is giving me my number of days and then I can also put in for my actual date up here. Because in case I collapse this, I could go OK equals this and copy that across. So I've just formatted that differently. Uh, and what I wouldn't do is equal to J21. I go equals J21 hash. You see, you can just type the hash symbol in. And then if I change this from four to eight to whatever, my periods automatically extend. How cool is that? That is what I want to actually do here. Now, I'm going to create something called not revenue. Um, when you're testing models and things like this, you might actually decide to put some random numbers in there to actually see how it all works. And with the random number in here, I'm going to go, OK, well, let's let's create a random number. A trick to force um, a calculation in each cell in a spilled range is to use an if statement. So if I say if and I'll click on these cells. That's all you need to do. So as long as there's a number in there that that will say that will give a value of true as long as it's not zero. Then I'll use the old Excel function rand between and generate a, a random number between 100 and 200, let's say, otherwise nothing. If I click that, oh, if I press F9 all the time, it will keep generating the numbers, but it's the same number in each period. And this is a classic gotcha here. When you start using these things, it's very easy to find that your random, sorry, your random, your dynamic arrays do not calculate separately in each cell. You've got to be careful of staying away from functions that tend to coerce the value. If can cause a problem, so can sum, so can offset and other ones in here. And some of it is trial and error, which I just don't have time. But I want to show you here how you can sort of start making these calculations and edit your models and get them clever. So if we're not going to do it that way, what should we use instead? Well, there's another function in here which is actually called the rand array function, which is a new one that came out. So if I go rand array and what it says is how many rows? Well, I want it to go horizontally, so I'm going to use the same thing again. And the number of periods is going to be this thing, comma, and I want it to be between 100 and 200. Now, you can either have it as something with a decimal after it, so 107.4965882, or you can have it as an integer. So I'm going to have it true as an integer here, or just type one or whatever, and we'll put that in and press enter, and that's gone across. How easy was that? And, and the, similarly here, I can actually do another calculation for this one here. I can go equals minus, use the rand array function, and use a different view of it this time. Rand array, one comma, uh, the number of periods again is this thing. This time we'll do it between zero and one and I won't put the final argument in because if you don't put it in it's assumed to be false as a default so it'll come up with a, an actual view here and we'll multiply that by the value above and there you go 
got some values. Now what I need to do is I need to put a border in. Put a border there, not yet. I'll put it in a second. Now, if I go Alt equals, fine on that, I'll have to copy it across. If I start doing instead the sum function, so if I go down here and I put in the not sum, I could try and force it again, as I was showing you before that trick, equals if open brackets, um, let's say uh, this one, J27, and I went, OK, let's go sum, open brackets, this, comma that, you might think this might force it to work, but this is one of those that coerces, so if you put that, so you get the same value in each one, which is clearly not right. This one here is actually summing the whole range. That's not the way to do it. The way you have to do it, if you're going to add them, is you have to go back to the operator here and go equals this plus that. So it's just showing you how you can do some modeling with modern Excel, dynamic arrays, hot off the post, becoming generally available. I know they've been around for a while, but no one's really been showing these sorts of features today because of the fact that uh, it's, it's going and it's, it's not been generally available to everyone. So now that you've got it on the web, you can at least play with it and go in there. As I say, go and have a look at it. If you haven't got it on the web, do come back. It is rolling out at the moment. It was announced at Ignite, so it's coming out very shortly. So that just gives us some ideas. Now, I'm not planning to do every single example in here because there's some that you can have a look at and play with afterwards. Uh, what I wanted to show you now is one of the issues with this is that if I actually take this here and create a chart out of it, I can go here and go um, uh, Alt. So sorry for the uh, Mac users in there, but Alt F1 will create a little chart for me like this, which is going to be a bit like a graphic equalizer when I press the F9 function. Cool, isn't it? That's just my new graphic equalizer. Um, what I want to do though is if I change the number of periods in here, let's make it six. My chart is still showing seven and eight. And if I make this 11, it's not working. Is there a way I can make my chart update automatically? And the answer is yes. And modern Excel, I take modern Excel to be everything, and people are going to laugh here, from Excel 2007 onwards when 2003 was cast aside and we got the ribbon. And in that version, we got tables. And I've shown you the table already. I created this earlier. Oh, yeah, he did. He's put a table in here. Why have I created a table? Well, normally what happens if I go to my dynamic data, let's let's go back to this one here. I'm going to put this. I'm going to create here uh, an actual chart. Just simply, oh, F1, one big chart. Just put it here. Doesn't matter if I plonk it over here. I've got my data here, looking nice. Now, what happens is I get the of August come in. Good to see that that was formatted the same. That did say first of August. Format it the same. We've got this in here. It doesn't do it. So you, what the normal thing is people do is they go in here, they go select data and they go and say, right, go and edit. And then what you do is you go and change this from G17 to G18 and so on. Seem familiar? Don't do it that way. If you're going to be doing this and you're looking at modeling and you're looking for modeling tips here, this doesn't require dynamic arrays or anything. You just go in here and I'm going to actually highlight this and I'm going to go insert table. Keyboard shortcut, Control T. When I do that, my table has headers. This should come on automatically if the data type in the top row is different from those uh, in the ones below. Do check though, because it doesn't always get it right. And in this case, we do want the table to have headers. We'll click OK. Always, always, always before you do anything else, then name it as something. So I'm going to call this something that will be informative. So call it you know, something meaningful. Nothing not literal, nothing meaningful. And then what I can do is I can highlight this data again and I go create a chart, Alt F1, or if you've not got this insert and go through the charts this way, should you wish. I have my chart, put this over here. Now let's put the 1st of September in. How cool is that? One dynamic chart. 
going through this this is one of the things i wanted to actually show you here is that you know it's it's one of these things that if we're going to go modeling we're trying to make everything as easy as possible i see people spending their time manually making adjustments to charts with features that have been around forever some people know tables and things like this but don't realize if you actually put your chart data into a table if i then start putting more sales here and I'll just make this equals 50% times this cell to the left. Let's just say it's automatically updating. The, these are sorts of things that are just quick tricks that can actually make your life so much easier. Staying away from all the Power Pivot, Power Query, all this sort of stuff in here. I'm just going to make it nice and easy uh, going through. I can turn that into a rolling 12 months if I want. So in this one, I've already created the table. I showed you when we were doing the example earlier, if you remember, I called this one source data. And what I'm going to do now is turn it into a particular chart. So one of the things that I would have had to have done in the past is I will actually uh, come in here and say, OK, well, what's the final period in here? Well, I'll go to this and work it out. It's going to be the final period, assuming this is all in order it's going to be the final one down here so i've gone 12 periods I want to go down so in this one i'll go open brackets all of this highlight that now notice the syntax when you select the whole column you don't get f11 to f27 you get the syntax of actually source data date which see why it's important to name the table you can do it afterwards and it will update that it will propagate but it's just easier to do it this way so if i put that in there like that I have my source data and then what I need to do now is actually get my my value. Now, what function could I possibly use to get this data up? So tricks here. There's a new function out there called XLOOKUP and I'm going to show it to you in a moment. Now, XLOOKUP is not generally available yet. It's coming out soon with its uh, partner in crime X match, but I will show it you uh, in, in passing in a moment. But one of these things is I can use another function from that family. Everybody who knows me knows I am not passionate about VLOOKUP. I've got examples where I can actually break it and do other things with it, and it's just one of these things that upsets me. Um, and then you get the other brigade that want index match and go down this route. If you have dates in here, so if I go through and I go equals EO month like this, so I'm using the function I did before, and go comma minus one, so I'd say one period earlier, that will take me the, the date minus one here. That's fine. That's all good. That's not what I want, though, is it? I want this time it to be the first of the month. So I'm going to have to use E date, which was the other one. So I'll go in here, E date, not E harmony. And we will copy that back. I've got all my dates. One of the things is if you've got things in sequential order that you can use is the simplest function here is possibly lookup. And even though we're in modern Excel and lookup is one of the oldest functions out there, it's still something that is quite robust that will work on all versions in the meantime. I will show it here and then I will actually use afterwards the X lookup afterwards to show you. So lookup, what's in sequence? I will go here. OK, the lookup value is this. I want it to go and look up in this range here and return this range there. Now, actually, as lookup stands, if the number of rows is greater than the number of columns, you can actually do this and it will look up in the first column and return in the last one instead. So instead of that, I can actually go do this. Of course, this is how all chart data is going to be. It should be like that. It will put it in 314, which is that. And if I copy it back, it will put it in. Right. Now, the cool new function that's come out, if you haven't got access to it yet, so I'm showing this, so I'll just put in here, there's a, do, does everybody know formula text out there? Came out in 2013. If you click on this cell here, it shows you what's in that formula. So it's a good way for documentation here, which is also useful for modeling. If I go in here, okay, I will use XLOOKUP. I'm in the new insider version of Office 365, so I do have the XLOOKUP function here. There's lots of things I can do with this. The XLOOKUP value says, right, what is it you're looking for? I'm looking for this date. It doesn't have to be in any sort of sequence order. Where is it? It's in this range here. And then what is it I want to return? The corresponding value in this column. So it works like LOOKUP but it has three more arguments. You can specify what to do if it's not found. 
you can actually talk about the match mode, whether you want an approximate match or an exact match. And you can also go for search mode about whether you're doing a binary search or a, a different type of search or whether you're actually going from the start or the end or whatever. So there's, there's different ways of going through this. I'm just going to keep it to the three main ones and you will see this returns the same values. So going forward, once you have it, I would suggest using XLOOKUP. So if I put this instead of N, I'll make it M22 so you can see the syntax. Maybe slightly longer, but don't be put off by that. It's got more features so you can actually put things in. Once I have that, well, then it's easy to create my chart, isn't it? I can actually create my chart. Uh, so I just go here and I'll go Alt F1 again, which is my little trick. Here's my chart. Just put it here. If I hold the Alt button down, I can make it snap. Just putting it out over here. Now, I want to name this and say that it's actually going to be the last 12 months to June 2019. You know, so how can I do that? Well, one of the things here is I'm going to get the last date. So I'm going to put in here what we call mixed text. So I'm going to write a formula here. I'm going to code equals sales because it starts, it's got to start with equals because of the fact um, we've actually got in here uh, a formula for sales for last 12 months and you can make the number 12 dynamic if you wanted to. Ending. And typically we tend to put spaces in here, but uh, obviously I'm making it optional. Now, we can use the concat, the text join operators, the concatenate function. You know what? I'm going to use ampersand here because it's even simpler than that. I'm going to join it up with this date here. Look at that. Sales for last 12 months ending 43.617. That's quite a long way in the future, isn't it? It sounds a long way off. Uh, not going to be doing that. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to actually use the text function. So the text function formats this because I can't change this using a date. If I go in here and go control one to format cells, uh, what will happen is if I go to custom in here, or actually I don't need to go to custom, I can just go to date and I change it to one of these and click OK. Nothing happens because this isn't a date, it's text. So I've got to go through a different way. So what I have to do is use the text function and then you specify using the custom number formatting and I'll put in MMM space YY, which means put the month into three letters with the year to two. And then I get sales for the last 12 months ending June 2019. Once I have that, I can click on chart title, go to the formula bar, click on E and click on this cell here. Sales for 12 months ending June 19. There you go. And if I change this and put this in, so I have the 1st of August. Let's take this and have one more period. I go here, 777. It's now got sales for last 12 months ending July 2019. And my chart automatically updates. Now, yes, I can change the font size and do all the other things, which I don't have time to do in an hour session. But how cool is that? This is how we can actually create uh, in modern Excel. We can do, I'm trying to show you some the forecasting, the modern reporting, how we can use this. But some of this is old school stuff as well. Don't forget that because it's quite nice. Right, um, other things I'm going to actually look at here. I, I'm just conscious of the time here. I might go and show you about creating a pivot table next. So a lot more examples in here than I have time for. So I wasn't quite sure how long it all take. Let me show you this thing. So I've got here uh, an actual table. Now I've already uh, called this a table. This is called football underscore data. Now I know a lot of people in the world are going to be thinking about uh, Aussie rules or US uh, football or whatever. I'm going to talk about what the rest of the world thinks of as football, which is soccer. So and I'm not going to go to the English Premiership. My team is in the division below that, and I think you'll work out in a few minutes what my team is as I plow through. What I want to show you is an alternative to pivot table. Hey, sorry, gang. I don't know what's the matter. Oh, honestly, I've, uh, I, all, all the things I'm using are Microsoft products. Um, one of the things is, yeah, I can, <laughs> I can hear somebody laughing in the background. Uh, can, can I ask uh, my colleague there, to, can he mute his mic as well? I can hear myself, thank you. Um, Right, so hopefully everyone can hear me. What I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to actually 
produce a pivot table over here. Now, obviously, this formatting you'd have to put in afterwards. I didn't think you wanted to watch me spend an hour doing formatting. So what I'm going to do is actually create a list of all the unique teams here. Oh, wouldn't it be good if there was a function like sort unique or something here? Well, there is. Well, one of the new dynamic functions here, and again, this is generally available now on the web. So, you know, you can start playing with this on the web, even if you can't do it on your desktop Excel for the time being. I can go here and unique. Now, this function kills me. Unique, the only function in Excel that it seems to me, apart from aggregate and subtotal, that's got multiple meanings. It actually can be one of two things. Either it means it will give you a list of all the items that are in the list, just the ones. So if I've got A, B, C, 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 D, E, it will give me A, B, C, D, E, being the five distinct items. But there's another one, which is say, if I've got A, B, C, 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 D, E, it will return A, B, D, and E, because they're the only ones uh, that occur once and only once. Now, fortunately, the default to this is the one that I think most Excel users will go for is, I want a list. I want to go through and the trick we used to do if you wanted to get a distinct list out of something in the past if you knew this trick was you would actually go and highlight this here and you go right i'll insert a pivot table so i'm going to go in here and i go okay insert uh i'll go to a pivot table i'll do it on a new sheet click okay and then what i do is I put my football club in here and there's my list and then I go and copy that and do whatever I wanted to do. And that was a way that we used to have to go and do this to sort it all out. So I'm going to go and uh, not do it that way. I'm going to do it formulaically. So with this, I'm going to go equals unique. Oh, we could try that one, see how that works out. That could be an interesting event. And I'm going to click on this. And when there's lots and lots of data, control shift down arrow is a good one to put in there. So if I click that and press enter, and I'll just go control home to bring me back up to front no I won't because my keyboard won't let me do that I get my list and this is showing it in the order that it appeared but I want to sort it see it's spilled see it's spilled it's another dynamic function would it be good if I could just type sort in front of it so if I go sort and then after that just go close brackets how cool is that I've got my list of actual teams here I can widen that and I've got this nailed down quite happily and then what I can do here is I can actually put in my months. Now, for these months, what I've actually done is, for those of you that aren't familiar with the football seasons in other parts of the world, if I scroll right over here, I've got some lookup data that I've got the months here, that the first month of the season is August. It goes two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Now notice this table here, this one here is called look, LU months of year. Now this is a trick I use here. LU stands for lookup months of year for the months of the year, so I can use this arrange name. And this one here is called LU football month number. So I've got these two things in here. So I've got LU months a year and football month number. So I can go back to my actual thing here and go into here and say, all right, I'm going to put in here my formula. So I'm going to go, right, I want to, have in here my actual list. So I'm going to go and sort this all out. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go and sort this. So that equals sort by. So sort by says I can sort by something that isn't necessarily going to be displayed. So I'm going to do my football month month, which is going to be this one. I'll go control shift down arrow. So I've got the month. And then we're going to do it here by the football data month number, which is the one beside it. If I do that and press enter, I get a spill because there's not enough room for this. But that's OK. I haven't got I've got too much space, but what, that's all right. Because then I want that to be unique. So I only want the unique ones. And then the other thing I want to do, because there's there's data in this down here that I've got some, I've hidden some formulas in here. Didn't, got it, it should have knocked all this out. I'm going to go in here, I'm going to transpose this. So if I transpose this, so instead of it going down, it goes across. It looks a bit horrible, but building it up, I now get the months August to May. Now you're thinking, whoa, that's a bit hard. Look, dark room, towel round head, you can, you can do it. <laughs> 
you can work it out later as i say but it's it's, it's fairly straightforward putting things in and then i'm going to use nothing more than good old summifs from 2007 version summifs i'm going to say right what is it i actually want to do i want to get the points achieved so i'm going to go here control shift get my points achieved comma and what's the criteria well i want my football club so here's my football club data here and the criterion I'm going to use, and it is criterion in Microsoft. I know you say singular criteria is uh, criteria in there, but it is. And I'm going to go here. It's going to be this one here, which is these teams here, L13. I'm not bothering putting dollar signs in. And then I'm going to put my month. And I'll make it, let's go back up, these ones here. There you go, got all the points. I have got a pivot table. Now, if I decide that Ipswich Town actually scored 100 points in December, well, if you look at Ipswich Town here, let's just go Ipswich Town in December was this one. If I got that right, let's colour it in so we can see it. Make it that, I'll make it a, a white so we can see it. It's nine at the moment. If I change this to so one of the times, because there's more than one match played by Ipswich Town, I'll make that instead 100. You'll see that number automatically goes to 109. No refresh, no refresh. Come on, that's cool, isn't it? Oh, I need a round of applause at this point in time. Let's create a league table as well, because I'm, I'm going to take this away now. So for reporting, you could actually look at your business units. You could see how they're doing, compare it by statistics. I'm trying to think of something that to put it in and do something a bit different. As I say, I'm a POM originally from the UK, so I need to come in and put this stuff in. So I need to actually work this out. Now, I am employing a trick here. I am actually going to have the points achieved that I've got. I've got. I've got in here the points achieved is only I'll change that back to zero because it's going to ruin my thing. If I were to put a filter in here, so if I get data and I went in here and I put a filter, I've actually got the points achieved in each one, either naught, one or three. It's not for a loss, one for a draw and three for a victory. If I put those in here, I could put three, one and zero for win, draw or loss, but I could get it to sort them. So I'm going to go through and go, OK, I'm going to go equals unique again. And I want it's going to be on the football data points achieved. Now that's a three. Now what the heck? Why is that a W? Well, that's because I've gone in here and put any number will appear as a W in this line. Well, that's a bit of a cheat, Liam. How have you done that? You see, I made that a W. And in the next one, it's going to be any number will be a D, and in here it will be an L. Right for three, one and zero. So I've got so I've got three, one, zero. Now I want to actually sort this. So I'm going to sort this and I want to sort this in the descending order. So wins come first. So I'm going to go here, comma, comma, minus one, close brackets. And then what I want to do is that will give me it's three, one, zero, and then I'll transpose it. So it actually goes instead going across. And I have it's in here. So I've got the actual numbers three, one and zero for one drawn and lost. And that's going to be useful. But guess what? I'm going to be doing another of my formulas in a minute to nail down these particular functions. So let's get my team in here to show you how we can get through. So I'm going to actually sort this. I'm going to, I'm going to build this all in one go now, just conscious of the time. So I'll go sort by, sort by, and we're going to do it on L13, which is this little list here again. We're going to say this time, we're not going to do it alphabetically. We're going to actually do it on the number of points calculated. I'm going to do that by working it out in this formula. So I'm going to go sum if open brackets. The range is going to be the football data football club, which is going to be. Not that one, so it's going to be in here. So I've gone called my. Is it the right one? I'm going mad. Ah, if I had a brain, I'd be dangerous. So in here, football data, football club. And we'll go in here. It's got to be. So my normal keyboard shortcut is not working at the moment. So that's going to be L13. And then the football points achieved is going to be this one. And we will do that. Comma. Minus one. Close brackets. 
Oh, sorry, and I need another close bracket there. Right, put that in. I've now got these in the right order. Now I can work out my other calculations in here that need to go through as I've got the right teams. So I'll use just count if for this one equals. Sorry, that that was a bit more uh, persistent that time. I tried a few times. Sorry, everybody. Uh, probably better with the sound off knowing me, but that's another story. So if I put L49 and put those in here, that gives me this close brackets, get my points. And just two more things to put in here for the actual points achieved. I'm going to put in here uh, uh, equals count ifs. Tab. And we'll go in here, the football data, the football club. Comma. Then it's going to be the football team again. Oh, I wish it was on the other computer. I could just use the keyboard shortcut to get that back. You're probably wondering, why aren't you just using the keyboard shortcuts to actually go back up to the top? It's because they're not working on this computer. I do know them. Um, then we'll go for the points achieved. And then we want it to be in this case. Please work. This one going across those three. And if I press that, enter, I get all the actual amounts. And then to actually work out the total points, it's just going to be, well, there's there's lots of different ways I could do this, um, but I will go in here equals, in here, another formula, equals sort, open brackets, sum if, open brackets, football club. It's the same thing as before, again and again and again, and would be a lot faster on a different keyboard, but we'll get it there. And then we'll go back to L49 hash. See so going through, and then the football data points achieved. comma, comma, and we want it in descending order, and that should give you the total points. Now, sorry I got preoccupied on the things here, but that's giving you an idea of a league table and going through, and perhaps you can actually work out what's the team that I actually support now. Now, one of the things with this is with a pivot table, the normal one, Liam, the thing you can do on that is you can double click on this, and it will drill down and give you the data. Well, this won't. So what I can do instead of that is go in here and say, right, well, let's actually go through and create this data instead. So let's have, for instance, I don't know, Aston Villa, and we'll have a month. March, wouldn't it be good if I could actually provide the data for this? And the way we do this is we use another of the dynamic functions now available. If I could type in here filter, and the array I'm going to put in here is go back to my football data sheet. So I'm going to take all of this in here. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually have two conditions for it. So what it is to include. I want it to be that the football team has to be Aston Villa and that the month is the month specified. So I, I click on this and I put this down, the whole thing, and that gives me that. And then I go, OK, that has to equal. And we go back to this. G12. Now, always get rid of the sheet name when it comes back on here because it can cause problems if you copy sheets. That will give me a set of trues and falses going down there that it stores in memory. If I actually put it in brackets, that forces it to calculate first. And then I'm going to put it multiply by the second condition, which is going to be the month has to be March. So if I do the month here, if I go down here, control shift, football month. Now that month is full. I need it to be just the first three letters. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to say use the left function, an old text function, to just take the first three letters of that. And that equals back to this again, March. And again, we'll get rid of the G13. So we have that, close brackets. Now, I want it to be that if I can't find it, I want it to actually say, uh, give me not located. And because I've got four, what is it I've got here? I've got four fields, football club month number, uh, month number of points achieved. I'm going to put it in braces to say it's an array I'm going to put in. I'm going to put for the first one, not found. And then, because it's another column across, if it was a, if it was a row, we put a comma in. If it's a column, you put a semicolon in. I will just go like that, semicolon, braces, close brackets. And what that will do is it will put the actual teams in when we do this. If we change it to another one, 
Bolton Wanderers, we get the dates. Now, if we find one where there are no points for particular teams, so if I go back up to my data here, I've got Hull City in January. Let's just see what happens if I go here. If I go to this Hull City and I make it January, not found. And sorry, I put, I have put the semicolon on it. So it's comma. I'm going mad, comma, comma. So I'm t I told you the wrong way around. Should I rehearse this? Shouldn't I? There you go. It goes the right way. Idiot. Comma for going across a column in, in the row, and it's a colon for going down. Now you see the difference. That was a deliberate thing because I wanted to show you the difference. And if you believe that, you'll believe anything. So I've spent most of the time on modeling here, and there is actually some point here about forecasting as well. And I want to show you another feature, nothing to do with dynamic arrays or anything uh, that I have actually blogged about on the Excel blog thing, which is uh, how you can actually forecast numbers from what's going on. Uh, a little bit of theory, first of all, here. I've got a chart here where you plot historical data on a chart in a scatter plot. So imagine all those blue dots on this particular chart show me all the data over time. So I've got two variables, X and Y. X is what I call my independent variable. Well, that's the one I can choose, I can select, I can pick from. And Y is dependent on that. So if I pick X, what happens to Y? So for instance, if you were thinking about this, if you didn't know which way around this would be, imagine if somebody said to you, what will my sales be for December? Sounds a lot more reasonable than my sales are three million six hundred twelve thousand five hundred nine dollars and sixteen cents. What month is it? Who am I and where are my car keys? So clearly here X would be the month and Y would be the sales. Now, obviously I've only got a short amount of time, got 13 minutes or whatever left here. Uh, the, the plan here is that um, I'm looking at linear regression only. Um, you can have other types. To be honest, if you find you can't put a line through it like this, try plotting the logarithm of X against the logarithm of Y, and there's various functions in Excel that can do that. If you then get a line through it, if the gradient of that is two, then there's a relationship between log Y equals two log X, which is the same as log Y equals log X squared, which means there's a relationship between Y and X squared. Similarly, if the rate, uh, gradient was three, you'd have a relationship between Y and X cubed. If you find there's no relationship after that, try getting your data down to more granularity. So if you've got trying to forecast all your revenue, break it down by product type, business unit, things like that. And see if you can find a relationship, you may have obfuscated it all with the fact of the product mix. Once you've got this sorted, um, you'll either have, there is some sort of relationship or there isn't. Now the gradient is given by the change in Y, the delta Y over the delta X, which for some reason is M, and the Y intercept C, here it gives us the equation of a straight line y equals mx plus c. So on this basis we could forecast. If we have the forecast number going between uh, one of the minimum dots and one of the, the final dots that's known as interpolation and outside of that range it's extrapolation. Obviously interpolation is safer. Now there are functions that can help you do this uh, and so one of the things I'm going to show here is imagine I've got these sales here and I'm going to create a nice simple chart. We're not going to put it in a table this time after all the stuff I did before. So I'm going to go here, Oh, F1, one chart here, and I'm going to turn it into a line chart. So we'll just go in here, change chart type. Let's have it as a line chart. Uh, click OK. I don't want this one. Go away. Go away. And we've got it going in here. And I want to forecast the next 12 months. Now there are various functions that will help with do this. In the time I'm going to is trend and trend talks about known y's known x's new x's and constants and this is why i needed to do the preamble because if you just looked at this you think what the hell and, and this is the point here that my known y's and my known x's you refer back to that other point so here clearly my period number is my x's and my sales my y's so my known x's here are going to be uh, so known y is going to be my sales make those absolute. So back in normal Excel here, legacy Excel, my periods are here. And then I'm actually going to take this one, F25, and I'm not going to specify the constant. If, if you start specifying the constant, you're sort of suggesting where the Y intercept is, and then you won't be drawing the best straight line through it, will you? That's the whole point here. So we'll just ignore that last one and we'll copy that down. Now this gives us an objective measure of forecasting.
So many of you may have been, when you build financial models, come up with what is known as the hockey stick projection. Well, ladies and gentlemen, making its debut here for you live from Redmond, we have the swordfish projection. So we have here the swordfish. If you actually show this to a board, I don't think you'd have a job for very long as your projection. But this is what linear regression does. It forecasts a line. Well, duh, according to Billy Eilish. So let's um, let's work out how we can do something better with this. What we've actually done is we've done what's called uh, exponential double smoothing. Sounds like some sort of coffee drink. Let, let me explain. If I had the numbers four, five, six, and I wanted to forecast the next one, if I used a naive method, and it's known as the naive method, then you just take the last number and keep using it. So it'd be four, five, six, 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 six. But then there's different forms of average. You can say, okay, well, four plus five plus six divided by three is five. So I go four, five, six, five, five, five. These are all estimating just the next point, because if you do anything after that, you're going to have to use one of your calculations in there. Um, uh, apologies, guys, for going slightly over, but I, I won't go over long. Uh, no, apologies for the technical issue there. So I put, can you hear me? And goodness knows what happened, but we're back. Uh, you can't keep me down for long. Um, what happens here, like a bad temp penny, I keep turning up. I've got these numbers here. It's giving me this forecast. So what I can do objectively, if I go control C and paste as values instead, rather than actually just have it on a trend, why don't I try and introduce some cyclicality or seasonality into it as well? Um, paste these as values to avoid a circular in a minute, because I'm going to sum these all to equals. That gives me the first 12. And this one here is I'm going to take this and sum the next 12. And that will give me some numbers. Now, again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go paste as values. And go, right, let's take that, divided by that, minus one, 4.92%. So that's the implied growth in one period cycle. If I go through and say, okay, equals that, and multiply it by one plus that growth that's inherent in this calculation, make that absolute, and copy that down, I now get something that actually looks more like a forecast going forward. I've introduced a third parameter. So I've got the point, I've got the direction or the trend, that's the second dimension, and the third dimension is actually the seasonality or cyclicality. The fact that I, if you put coefficients in front of this, there'd be parameters in front, the exponents knows this to be exponential uh, triple smoothing is what, what's going on here. So we've got our forecast. Wouldn't it be good if there was a simpler way to do this? Well, guess what? If I go back to this and uh, I'm just going to try and uh, resize this Excel thing here. If I go to my original data here, here's something that's actually got more than one cycle in it. I've got some data here and I've got it going down till October 2019. If I use the trend method, as I've just shown you here, and sorry, this isn't sized for the right thing here. I was going through that. I know why it wasn't sized. It's because I'd actually assumed the ribbon would go like this. I'll put that back up like that. You can see I've got my swordfish. In the next one, and I'm not going to go through this, I wouldn't have gone through it even if I hadn't got cut off. I've actually gone through and used an offset function, goodness knows what else, to predict cyclicality and actually do it formulaically. So you can, if you're really bored and sad, you can work out how I actually did this and we can actually find an actual growth and plot it through. And I've done a calculation which is similar to that manual manipulation I did a second ago. But if you've got 2016 onwards. Here's something cool. Wouldn't you like to be able to do this one? Now, okay, because I've changed the resolution, my uh, it's messed up my axis down here. Let me show you how difficult this is. You might want to take notes at this point because it's very, very complicated. You go back to your original data. You go to when in this original data, if I can find it here, you select all the data that you have to here. Then you go to the data tab and there is a button here called forecast sheet. Click. Sorry, click. Yep. Did you write that down? The forecast end. And let's make it December 2021. And we'll put it the 31st of December. And you can change the options if you want to have different confidence intervals and so on and so forth. Uh, if I put that through, the great thing is with this now is I can't get to the bottom of the <laughs> right, let's try that again. Data, oh, more haste, less speed. I'll just make it to 2021. Won't bother changing the cycle, hit create, and it produces this on another sheet. 
And look, that's the chart you can... Pardon? Oh, you're joking. All right, I'm going to start this from the beginning again. I'm sorry in terms of for those that are going to, I didn't realize we're having. So you've only got the PowerPoint slide. So what has probably happened is if I go in here is how do I. Right, let's go back into here. Share. And we'll go to screen one. That's what I did. I did the wrong one. That's why it went wrong. OK, so sorry, guys. Let's go back to this. I will show that last bit again. So I don't know what you missed. Um, so I'll go back to this and I'll knock this out and just start this again. And apologies, everybody. I had the trend numbers going through and I'd worked out. So I copied and pasted the values of trend to here. I then did the totals and then I pasted them as values as well because I wanted to actually work out what the growth rate was. And I worked out H37 over G37 is these two cells. It's giving me the implied growth rate. I've added my third dimension now, which is the cyclicality or seasonality, which is taking the one from 12 months previously and do one plus the growth rate times this, make it absolute. Put that down. And we have our actual numbers go through. We now have something that looks more reasonable. Now, a lot of statisticians will tell you, oh, you can't do it like that. There's loads of things why that's wrong. But you know what? If it actually helps convey things over, that's fine. If you think about it, the first point was we didn't just go for one point. We looked for a trend, so we were in double smoothing. But by introducing this third parameter of seasonality or cyclicality, we've got a third element, what's called triple smoothing, the exponential triple smoothing, which is what we've got here. And I've done this manually. What I then showed, which you didn't see, because unfortunately uh, uh, you're on the PowerPoint slide, my apologies. Um, hopefully you can see this now is I've got some data which shows if I have the original data and put this in, I want to forecast this going forward. So this has got more than one loop in it. I, mean, I kept it simple for my idea here. With this one, I use the trend function. So if I went down here to the bottom, here's that trend formula. If you see this at symbol, that just means it was built before Excel uh, had the dynamic arrays in it, and it's using the old funky style of Excel. So ignore the at symbol there, it just means don't worry. Um, so we've got in here our actual calculations, and we've got this swordfish. I then can create a calculation around that, say, well, there's a 12 month cycle in it and do a little bit of calculation dexterity. I'm not going to go through and I can generate this formulaically, but there is another way you can do it. Wouldn't you love to have this Christmas tree approach? And this is what I was saying. This is just done with click. That's all you have to do. Let me show you if I go back to my original data uh, and I highlight this. So if I go uh, to here and then go not down all the way, but where the data actually lies. Now the keyboard shortcut wants to work. I can then go to the data tab and click on forecast sheet. This shows me what's going on here. I can change this to be more periods for once. So I can make it go out to December. And I can change other options in here, which will talk about confidence intervals and things like that, which I can change for one. I'll hit create and it's in. There's my chart. Here's my data. I can jazz this all up. And here with these things, you've got the formulas if you want them. Meet the forecast.ets function, exponential triple smoothing that I was talking about. We've also got here other formulas, confidence intervals. I don't like the fact there's hard code of the confidence interval here. That represents 95%, but you can change this. But how cool is this? You can create these things and make them look all pretty like this in seconds. Right. I am out of time. I'm so sorry about the technical glitch in the middle. Uh, always judge people not by the errors that happen, but how they deal with them. And I dealt with it very badly, but that's OK. I, I'm still here. I'm still standing and it's not the worst thing that's ever happened. If you have any queries about any of this, drop me an email either at liam.bastic at someproduct.com or contact. We'll send you the file. We'll also put the file for circulation on the uh, Microsoft platform as well. So we have it there. Um, as I say, if you enjoyed this session, uh, my name's Liam Bastic. If you didn't, my name is Tim Heng, uh, who will be presenting next month. You'll enjoy that. But I am happy to take questions if there's still time. Did we have any questions? They all either fell asleep or um, they, they switched off when it all vanished. I'm really sorry about the technical glitches, but uh, we got there in the end, and I'm sure we can edit that bit out, can't we? Can't we? <laughs> <laughs> the magic of television.
I'll just hang on for a minute or two in case there's any questions. Now you don't know if my microphone's working or not. <laughs> Ah oh dear, the joys. I'm not on Wi-Fi. I'm on a hardline Wi-Fi connection and still everything goes wrong. Lovely. OK, well, thanks very much, everybody, then. Um, it seems like there's no questions here, so I will say a bid you adieu. Um, next month, my colleague Tim Hammond, I believe, is presenting. I'm sure there'll be details in the the uh, in the future. Drop me an email if you have any questions. I'm more than happy to enter them answer them and uh, do check out our website as well. Thanks very much. <laughs>